in Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount, beginning in verse 19, Jesus teaches, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Of this treasure, Matthew Henry writes, It is something the soul will have, which it looks upon as the best thing, and which it has pleasure and confidence above all other things. There are treasures in heaven. Let us consider for a moment these treasures. This topic is much discussed and one about which many books have been written. And often the questions that arise go something like this. Um, what will heaven be like? What will we do in heaven? Will we have bodies? What will those bodies look like? When, when will we be in heaven? And these are fair questions when we consider that we will spend eternity there. But reason with me for a minute. When we consider the Bible as a whole, I think that it is significant that God shares very little about these things that are in heaven. Sometimes scripture gives us glimpses couched in metaphors and similes to describe the things that are in heaven, things that are so wonderful that they're barely able to be conceived. But they are only hints and glimpses and they rarely satisfy our curiosity. In stark contrast, and not by accident, God has shared a lot about himself in the Bible, who he is, his power, his holiness, his glory, his love, his concern for us, his desire for us, his willingness to sacrifice for us, and of his son. The story of the Bible is the story of Jesus. In the Old Testament, we anticipate him. In the Gospels, we learn of him. And through the, and through the epistles, we are led by him. Does it not stand to reason then that our attention when we think about heaven should not be so focused on the things that are in heaven, but who is in heaven? Amen. And when we think about heaven, should our thoughts not first and foremost focus upon our God? Whatever else contributes to the fullness that is heaven and what God has prepared for us, that which will satisfy our souls in which our souls will find pleasure and confidence above all other things. Being with our Father and our Savior, these are the greatest treasures of heaven. And when our strongest desire is to be with our Father and to be with our Savior, then truly our hearts will be in heaven. And so with this in mind, with the understanding that Jesus was always the perfect example of everything that he taught, let us take a look at a day in his life and see what it means to lay up your treasures in heaven. Turn over to Mark chapter 1, if you will. And we begin reading in verse 32. That evening at sundown, they brought him all who were sick and were oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I have came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues, and casting out demons. Now to get a fuller sense of what his day was like, we need to roll the clock back a few hours to that morning, which are described in verses 21 through 31, which we won't take the time to read. As would be expected on the Sabbath, Jesus is in the synagogue and he is teaching. Those who are in attendance that morning saw and heard things that they had never encountered before. Jesus, this this carpenter taught us their scribes never had, and they were astonished. We would say they were blown away by the authority with which he taught. 
And as they sit there quietly absorbing all of this, wondering at his words, they are startled by the cry of a man who is possessed by an unclean spirit. And immediately Jesus silences the spirit and commands him to come out of the man. And the spirit obeys. Now those who had been astonished by the authority of Jesus' teaching are amazed by the authority over the spirit. And news about such things would not be contained. Mark tells us that then immediately after leaving the synagogue, Jesus went to the house of Peter and Andrew. And upon arriving, he learned that Peter's mother-in-law was sick. And so he came to her and he healed her. And as she prepared the meal, Jesus began his afternoon with his disciples. There would have been many questions about the events of that morning in the synagogue. And Jesus, in turn, would have much to say to these men who had set aside their lives to follow him. There was so much yet that they didn't understand, so much they had not anticipated when they decided to follow him. Meanwhile, word of what Jesus had taught and done in the synagogue that morning spread from house to house throughout the city. There was among them one who had power over demons and could heal with only a touch. Perhaps the account of Jesus healing Peter's mother-in-law had reached the streets as well. As a result, the hopes of many were renewed and raised. Those who were ill or oppressed by demons came to him or were brought to him by loved ones. And adding to the crowd would have been those who wanted to see a miracle, who wanted to, to see this man who could do such things. And so that evening at sundown, after the Sabbath had closed, Mark says the whole city crowded the home of Peter, pressing out its doors, desperate for help. Luke, with a physician's compassion, records what happens next this way. And Jesus laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. This would have lasted long into the night, extending an already busy and trying day. Finally, the crowds disperse and the house is quieted and all its inhabitants find the respite of sleep. But not long, off, not long after, while the others slept, Jesus rises very early while it is still dark and leaves the house to find a desolate and a quiet place to pray. Considering the events of the day, the demands upon Jesus that extended well into the night, we would expect him to take advantage of this time to, to rest and to sleep, to restore mind and body. Yes, Jesus remained deity, but in the body of a man, and men need rest. And not only to recover from the events of the day, but anticipation of what lay ahead the next day and the days that would follow. His first Galilean ministry. Then why, then why rise while others slept and venture out into the night. Because in this small window of time before dawn, when the crowds would return and his disciples search him out, Jesus longed to spend time with his Father, needed to spend time with him in whose presence he had spent all of eternity. And especially now, because for the first time and in a way I cannot fully explain, Jesus was separated from his father. This private communion was treasured more than sleep or rest, more than anything that could be found here in this life where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Here in heaven with his father, Jesus' heart remained. And this is just one example, just one day out of Jesus' whole life. His life was full of such examples. He longed to go home and be with his father. And though he knew that that road home would take him through Calvary, he traveled that road willingly because he wants us to come home with him.